Hello, this is Michael Sean, right smack dab at the beginning of episode number eight of our Free Range Texan podcast. And, what was that? I would, well, I just got to tell you, we got, for motorcycle riders, we got a story you're going to love coming up on this, uh, on this particular, what was that? On this podcast that we've got uh, professional musicians or garage band uh, extravaganza people either way you're gonna you're gonna like a story we've got particularly if, what was that particularly if you play the trombone of course at the end of the show campfire and what do you mean we have camels in the studio well, I know we've got the campfire, and we've got the story in the campfire, and we need camels for that story, but you, they came in, and you didn't know where to put them? You put them in studio, eh? So much bien. You guys roll the show, will you? Seven. Start the clock. Six. Stand by, Eddie Bay One. Five. Stand by, Sweetie Pie. Four. Bring studio mic hot. Three. Stand by Michael Shaw. Two. Roll music. One. Well, howdy, y'all. The Free Range Texan podcast is underway. This here program is a special look at the way life is shaping up for folks in the U.S. of A. Seen through the eyes of a born and bred West Texan. Our host is a veteran broadcaster who is known for his campfire visits on radio. Michael Sean is standing by. So here he is, our host, a real free range Texan himself, Michael Sean. Do you folks have any idea how hard it is to get a camel to do camel noises on cue? We have a remarkable set of professionals that we have hired to work behind the scenes on this podcast. And I'll be glad when they show up. Oh, I'm, I'm just kidding! Get those looks off your faces. Oh, we're glad everyone's here, <laughs> especially you folks. I'm, uh, I tell you, we got a heck of a show lined up for you here. A uh, couple of unconventional hunting stories going to be on our podcast. And uh, a little note for our friends, working musicians of Texas. We got uh, uh, one you might enjoy, our Heroes and Heroines file. I'm telling you, we're going to the campfire, and yes, there are camels. Where else are you going to get this kind of entertainment, folks? It's coming up on the Free Range Texan Podcast. Let's get ready to ride. Thanks, John Sanders, for sending in this story. You see, I had this idea that I was going to rope a deer, put it in a stall, feed it up on corn for a few weeks, then butcher it. The first step in this adventure was getting a deer. I figured that since they congregate at my cattle feeder and don't seem to have much fear of me or the rest of the wranglers around, it wouldn't be difficult to rope one. Just get up to it, toss a bag over its head to calm it down, of course, then hogtie it and transport it to the house. I filled the cattle feeder, then hid down at the end of my rope. The cattle, having seen this roping thing before, stayed well back. They weren't having any of it. After about 20 minutes, my deer showed up. Three of them, as a matter of fact. I picked out a likely-looking one, stepped out from the end of the feeder, and threw my rope. The deer just stood there and stared at me. I wrapped the rope around my waist and 
twisted the end so that I'd have a good hold on it, the deer stood and stared at me. But you could tell it was mildly concerned about the whole rope situation. I took a step towards it. It took a step away. I put tension on the rope and then received an education. The first thing that I learned is that while a deer may just stand there looking at you funny like while you rope it, they are spurred into action, you might say, when you start pulling on the rope. The deer exploded. The second thing I learned is that pound for pound a deer is a lot stronger than a calf or colt. That thing ran and bucked and twisted and pulled and there was no controlling it. Certainly no getting close to it as it jerked me off my feet and started dragging me across the ground. It occurred to me that having a deer on a rope was not necessarily as good an idea as I had originally imagined. The only upside is that they don't have quite as much stamina. A brief 10 minutes later, it was tired and not nearly as quick to jerk me off my feet and drag me when I managed to get up each time. It took me a few minutes to realize, since I was mostly blinded by the blood flowing out of the big gash in my head, I had lost my taste for corn-fed venison. I just wanted to get the devil creature off the end of my rope. I figured if I just let it go with the rope hanging around its neck, it would likely die a slow and painful death somewhere else. At the time, there was no love at all between me and that deer. I hated the thing, and I would venture to guess that the feeling was mutual. Despite the gash in my head and several large knots where I had cleverly arrested the deer's momentum by bracing my head against various large rocks as it dragged me across the ground, I could still think clearly enough to recognize that there was a small chance that I shared some tiny amount of responsibility for the situation we were in. So I managed to get it lined back up in between my truck and the feeder. A little trap I had set beforehand, kind of like a squeeze chute. I got it to back in there and I started moving up so I could get my rope back. Did you know deer bite? Well, they do. I never in a million years would have thought the deer would bite somebody, but I was very surprised when I reached up to grab the rope and the deer grabbed hold of my wrist. Now when a deer bites you, it's not like being bit by a horse where they just bite you and then let you go. A deer bites you and shakes his head like a pit bull. They bite hard and it hurts. The proper thing to do when a deer bites you is probably to freeze and draw back slowly. Not me. I tried screaming and shaking my hands around instead. My method was ineffective. It seems like the deer was biting and shaking for several minutes, but it was probably only several seconds. I, being smarter than a deer, decided I would trick it. While I kept it busy tearing the holy smolies out of my right arm, I reached up with my left hand and pulled the rope loose. That was when I got my final lesson on deer behavior for the day. You see, deer will strike at you with their front feet. They rear right up on their back feet and strike right about head and shoulder level, and their hooves are surprisingly sharp. I learned a long time ago that when an animal like a horse strikes at you with their hooves, you can't get away easily. The best thing to do is try to make a loud noise and make an aggressive move towards the animal. This will usually cause them to back down a bit so that you can escape. This was not a horse. This was a deer. So obviously such trickery would not work. In the course of a millisecond, I devised a different strategy. I screamed like a woman and tried to turn and run. Did I say woman? It was more like a little girl. The reason I had always been told not to try to turn and run from a horse that paws at you is there's a good chance that they'll run after you and hit you in the back of the head. 
deer may not be that different from horses after all, besides being twice as strong and three times as evil, because the second time, when I turned to run, it hit me right in the back of the head and knocked me down. Now, when a deer paws at you and knocks you down, it doesn't immediately leave. I suspect it doesn't recognize that the danger has passed. What they do instead is paw your back and jump up and down on you while you're laying there, crying and screaming like a little girl covering your head. I finally managed to crawl under the truck and the deer went away. And so now I know when people go deer hunting, they bring a big rifle and a scope. I suspect my deer roping days are done. And as this episode continues, I just have to tell you that we just recently went over our response list on the freerangetexan.net website. We have responses from Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, Romania, Brazil, the UK, Spain, India, Vietnam, Trilingua, Texas and so many more. We thank you all for listening to our podcast and for visiting our website at freerangetexan.net. There's a store there. May I unashamedly mention it to you, the Free Range Texan House of Treasures. I'm just saying it's that time of year again, and who doesn't love turquoise? There is turquoise specially reduced for our listeners. And there are some great gifts on display there at the Free Range Texan House of Treasures at freerangetexan.net. You might enjoy shopping around a little bit there. Well, there's some great music there, isn't it? Dun, 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 dun. Reminds me of a story I heard the other day. What's the difference between a dead frog in the road and a dead trombone player in the road? Well, you see, the frog was probably going to a gig. Well, it took me eight years to get it, so let me explain it to you now. When you go out hunting frogs, that's called gigging. Gigging is bad for a frog. But when you go out playing an instrument in a band for money, that's called gigging. Gigging is a good thing if you're a trombone player, but man, you gotta be good. You pretty much need a bass player and a drummer, but not many people need a trombone player, so they typically don't get many gigs. Did I explain that right? Wait, let me start all over. And now it's time for another edition of our Heroes and Heroines File. We've all known folks who had loved ones or served one way or another in the rough-and-tumble United States military. But did you know that there is one particular unit whose uniforms have no wrinkles, folds, or lint 
Guards dress for duty in front of full-length mirrors. The first six months of duty, a guard cannot talk to anyone or watch television. All of the soldiers' duty time is spent studying the 175 or so notable people laid to rest in Arlington National Cemetery. By now, you've become aware that I'm talking about the guards at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. The tomb guard marches 21 steps down the black mat, turns, faces east for 21 seconds, turns, faces north for 21 seconds, then takes 21 steps down the mat and repeats the process. The sentinel always places his weapon closest to the visitors to signify that the sentinel stands between the tomb and any possible threat. 21 was chosen because it symbolizes the highest military honor, the 21-gun salute. Each soldier must be in superb condition, possessing an unblemished military record. Notables buried there are President Taft, Joe Lewis, the heavyweight boxer, and Medal of Honor winner Audie Murphy, the most decorated soldier of World War II. Every guard spends five hours a day getting his uniform ready for the guard duty. And when cemetery officials are asked if any light has been shown on the identity of the remains in the tomb, military personnel will solemnly tell you the answer to that question is known only to God. It was back in 2003, a hurricane, Hurricane Isabel, was approaching Washington, D.C. Our United States Senate and House took two days off in anticipation of the storm. On the ABC Evening News, it was reported that because of the dangers of the hurricane, the military assigned to duty of guarding the tomb of the unknown soldier were given permission to suspend this assignment. They respectfully declined the offer. No way, sir. Soaked to the skin, marching in pelting rain from a full-blown tropical storm, they said that guarding the tomb was not just an assignment. It was the highest honor that can be afforded to a service person. The tomb has been patrolled continuously 24-7 since 1930. God bless them and keep them. Folks, we can be proud of our men and women in uniform no matter where they serve. I want to thank our listeners for choosing to spend a little time here, though, where we remember the heroes of this land. You've been listening to The Heroes in Heroines File on the Free Range Texan podcast. For information concerning this and other segments of our program, go to freerangetexan.net. I just have to tell you that it's pretty doggone humorous with some of us folks from here in the Southwest, or should I say, God's country. When we travel around to different places and we find ways to identify ourselves in some pretty unique and colorful ways. Recently, I flew into Seattle and the guy sitting behind me on the plane, a gentleman that I would describe as middle-aged, was wearing a baseball cap. Emblazoned across the front of it, it read, It's hard to be humble when you're from Texas. <laughs> I immediately thought back to the drive into the airport back home in West Texas where I saw a bumper sticker that said, Drive friendly, the life you save might be a Texan. I got off the plane in Seattle and it sometimes happens the person charged with picking me up at the airport texted me 
and said they were running late. So I stepped into a small coffee bar there and sitting across from me was a young teenager. And on his t-shirt it said, Scotty, be me back to Texas. I was beginning to feel at home. I just had to grin. As long as we're just visiting here anyway, let me tell you all about a pickup load of hunters who were looking for a place to hunt. They pulled into a farmer's yard in Deaf Smith County, Texas. The driver, Joe Bob, went to the farmhouse to ask permission to hunt on the farmer's land. The old farmer said, sure, you can hunt, but would you do me a favor? The farmer said, that old donkey standing over there is 20 years old and sick. I don't have the heart to put her down. Would you do it for me? Well, Joe Bob replied, of course I will, and strolled back to the pickup. Then he had an idea. He was going to play a trick on his hunting buddies, go figure. When they asked him if the farmer had said it was all right, he said, no. We can't hunt here, but I'm going to teach that old sod buster a lesson that he won't forget. What's that, Joe Bob? Well, Joe Bob rolled down his window, stuck his gun out, and shot the donkey. He turned to his hunting buddies and said, that'll teach him. Then, a second shot rang out from the passenger side, and one of his hunting buddies yelled, and me! I got the cow! Hi, this is Michael Sean. Welcome to the campfire. Heard a story inspired by L.L. Rigsby. Sometimes it seems like the hot desert wind never stops. A dust devil whipped at her long skirt and her copper curls. Clara lifted her head to shade her eyes and squint at the dusty horizon. Zack, her husband, had been gone for over a month now, and they were getting low on supplies. So far, their only claim to success was a pouch of gold dust they'd managed to glean from the creek bed. A distant cloud of dust, and a cavalry troop approached the homestead, looking for water, no doubt, she thought. The well she and Zack had dug was the only water supply for miles. Even the Indians stopped now and then. The cavalry troop cantered into the yard. She nodded at the half-full water tank. Help yourself, Mr. Bowden. Are you in a hurry? What's up? Engine trouble, he said. We have instructions to come out here and escort you back to the fort. She said, the Apaches have never given us trouble here. These ain't Apaches, ma'am. Some Comanche and Kiowa. I hear even Cochise is worried. What about the house? Abandoning it would be providing them with food, water, and ammunition. I'll stay here. My husband will be back any day now. The soldiers helped load water in the house. Then they departed and she was alone again. That's when she saw it, a flicker of light that didn't belong out there. Someone was watching the house. She lifted the heavy beam that locked the door, then bolted the heavy shutters. She took a pistol and a box of shells from the cabinet. Then she saw it again, only this time it was closer. She held her breath at the figures materializing in from the desert. Fifteen or so Indians rode in, paused at the water trough. Some drank beside their horses while others eyed the house. Finally, a Comanche Indian lifted his rifle. Clara ducked below the gun port. The rifle cracked and the bullet thunked harmlessly into the sod wall on the opposite side of the room. Two more shots, and then silence. 
She waited. As the sun shaped the long shadows of the evening, the Indians began to stir. After a while, Clara cautiously opened the door. Someone else was moving through the desert, riding up to the house, and then it was Zack riding into the yard. He gazed down at her and said, Are you all right? She nodded. I'm fine. Zack said, Do you suppose they've never seen a camel before? She turned to watch the dust as the Indians ghosted into the desert. Well, she said with a sigh, I guess our new stock is going to have more uses than we anticipated. I'm Michael Sean. Just one more reason why they're why desert campfires are always some of my favorites. See you next time. Adios, my friends. Well, first I'd like to say that no camels were injured or stressed out or anything in the making of our podcast. And we want to thank the folks at Camels Are Us. The rest of you get in there and clean up Studio A. There's camel residue in there. Hey, join us next time. Take us home, sweetie pie. Y'all been listening to the Free Range Texan podcast. If you'd like more information about our show or where to find the products we talked about on Free Range Texan, visit our website at freerangetexan.net. That's freerangetexan.net. Free Range Texan is produced out yonder at 18 PR Studios. Speaking for Michael Sean and the rest of our crew, this is Sweetie Pie, and we'll see you next time on the Free Range Texan Podcast.